This is Lecture 6, Part 1, East Asia. When we look at East Asia, we look at a huge economic powerhouse with such countries as China, Japan, Taiwan. Uh, there's a lot of money made in this region. Um, first, let's look at the physical region. The physical regions here, we have a couple. The Himalayas are the mountain range right in here. It's the same mountain range that's in India. They share it, and it serves as a good physical border between the two countries. We also have the Gobi Desert, which is in this region right here. It's a very, very dry region, mainly because of its continentality. It's so far inland that it's just really, really dry. And then we also have the Eastern Plain. There's not much to it, but it is kind of a low-lying, flat area where a lot of agriculture occurs, particularly in China. And that's the main country we're going to look at when we talk about East Asia. Uh, the two rivers, there's the Yellow, which is in northern China, and the Yangtze, or Changjiang, which is in southern China. Both are very prone to flooding, which causes some major problems. Real quick facts here, 50% of all American imports come from this region. If you look at your cell phone, you look at your iPad, your computer, maybe your vehicle that you drive... Uh, also, if you just get bored one day, look at your clothes, and all your clothes have a tag on. That tag says, made in Philippines, made in Taiwan, made in China, made in wherever. And most of the stuff you'll find in Walmart is made in China. Um, they also suffer, though. This region suffers from typhoons. We call them hurricanes over here. They call them typhoons over there. Same exact thing exactly the same thing. In the Indian Ocean, near India, they call them cyclones. Same exact thing. Just three different names for the same feature. Earthquakes, we know what earthquakes are. They have those there also. Particularly the central part of China and also Japan. We'll get to that later. Tsunamis, which are tidal waves, large tidal waves, typically those caused by earthquakes. Uh, they eat a lot of rice in this region. Breakfast, lunch, and dinner can all have rice in them in Eastern Asia. And there's a lot of seafood because there's a lot of people with just a little bit of land, so they have to turn to the ocean to get their food. So you have find a lot of seaweed, fish, kelp, uh, things like shrimp, crabs, lobsters are eaten in this region. And there's a, a, a aquaculture farm in that photograph there. China is the largest country in the world by population. If you lined up every Chinese person in a line, it would circle the globe 19 times over. That's a lot of people. They have like 1.2 billion people in China. One in every five people in China, are, or every people in the world, are Chinese. It's also the third or fourth largest country in area. It depends on what you call China and what you don't. But of all the land in China, only 31% of it is arable, farmable land. It's also home to the world's largest army. You have the world's largest population. You probably have the world's largest army. Uh, one of the most famous monuments in all of China is the Great Wall of China. It was built to keep the Mongolians out of China. It didn't work very well. There are two major dialects or two major parts of the Chinese language, Cantonese and Mandarin. And they sound a little different from each other. They have some words that are alike, but some words that are different. It's best way I could say is like Spanish and Portuguese are different. Well, Spanish actually has a couple different dialects. But they share a lot of similar languages, similar words, I'm sorry. Um, many in China are Buddhist, but many are also, also atheists. They have no religious beliefs. Communism predominates the government, how the government's run in China. Uh, pandas are from China. Kung Fu got its start in China. And China is typically known for its late marriages, meaning people get married when they're 28, 29, 30, 31, instead of getting married at 17, 18, or 19. And China also has a one-child policy, where the government promotes or wants the couples to only have one kid. When you look at China, China has many 
early dynasties, like the the Qin dynasty and the Han dynasty and the Manchu dynasty. These are long reigns of kings over time. Uh, the Silk Road was developed as a road that connected Europe to China so they could get silk back to Europe. Marco Polo was one of the first to uh, really promote this road. During the 16 and 1700s, China, uh, well, before that point, back in the 1300s, China was an exploring country. They would go out on their own ships and explore, and there's belief that the Chinese actually landed in Mexico sometime in the 13 or 1400s. But after that, they kind of closed their door and decided not to explore anymore. Since that point, though, Europe has come and explored China, so much so that the European powers started buying up land in China. So the Spanish and the Portuguese and the, the Germans and the British all owned little pieces of China, so much so that they wanted to engage in trade with the people who lived there. And they couldn't find anything the Chinese really wanted to buy from them. So they started getting them hooked on opium, which is a form of heroin, I guess you could say. And they got them hooked on opium so they could sell them opium to buy porcelain and silk and all the other fine things the Chinese made. Uh, this led to the Opium Wars, where the Chinese were trying to shove uh, European power out of China. This was later followed by the Boxer Rebellion, where the Chinese revolted against all these European powers. Um, after this, the Japanese started getting involved in invading China. And during World War II, the Japanese actually owned China, or most of it. After the fall of Japan, after World War II, you had two groups of people who were fighting over control of China, the nationalist and the communist. And we supported the nationalist and the Soviets supported the communists, and eventually the communist won. The communists pushed the nationalists out. The nationalists moved to Taiwan, and that became China up until about 1970 when mainland China was selected as the real China, I guess you would say that. Uh, the communist China was ruled by Mao Zedong, or Mao Zedong. Uh, he promoted communism. He, uh, he promoted organized agriculture. We live in these communes, these groups where we live together to promote growing crops. He, uh, but he wanted Chinese not to starve. He knew there were a lot of people and that we had a lot of mouths to feed. So he promoted everyone, let's all grow crops to make sure everyone's fed. In the late 1970s, he encouraged the Cultural Revolution where he basically went to war against all the intellectual people, all the smart people of China who opposed him. He went to war against them, killed a lot of people. We really don't know how many, but killed a lot. Um, but his policies of communism, of the government running everything, are still in control today in China, but they do allow for some businesses to develop, grow, work, create for the people of China. Uh, one of the big features recently in China is the Three Gorges Dam. It's the world's largest dam. They've dammed up part of this river to help irrigate the land near it. So basically, this lake now serves as a water supply for part of the country. The problem is that this lake, where there was no lake before, is so heavy now that it's caused an earthquake. And they believe that this earthquake will cause more earthquakes because of the weight the water now has on the land, where there used to not be any water. In China, you also have the autonomous region of Tibet. Tibet was at one time an independent country, but China took it over after World War II and claims it as their own. And so there's a big free Tibet movement where people want Tibet to become an independent country. It is home to the Dalai Lama, who is the, basically, you could call him the high priest of Buddhism, if you want to call him that. That's his temple, that's where he's supposed to live, but now he lives in India in exile because the Chinese will not allow him to live in China. It's also very high in elevation. This is at the foothills of the Himalaya Mountains. Um, and Mount Everest is in the shadow of Tibet, or Tibet's in the shadow of um, that mountain. 
one thing that China is doing is sinicization. It is like Russification, where they're sending Chinese people into Tibet. They're encouraging the Chinese to move there to make it more Chinese. Because if Tibet's more Chinese-looking, they speak the Chinese languages, then they are less likely to be Tibetan or to want to break away from China. And China has encouraged building rail lines, high-speed rail lines, and they're moving people, they're moving Chinese people out of the major cities of China to places like Tibet um, in an effort to try to make them more Chinese.